Okay. Hi. Thanks for the invitation. And um, thanks for being there and listening. I won't be able to see you much because, you know, I have a screen there and uh, with my presentation on it. So uh, I hope that you can save your questions for later. Normally, I would do it a little more interactively, but we'll just I'll just present quickly my thoughts and then we'll see. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yeah. Okay, Improvisation, Hegemony, and the Uncomfortable is the title. And it's really about a very small aspect of hegemony, which has lots of ramifications in my work. And um, the diversity aspect is not at all touched upon, but we can unfold it in discussion. Um, so the question is, what is improvisation? And I have a few questions that you might ponder while you think of it. Everybody forms their own idea about this word. It's a very often used word. Um, and um, in many situations, it's totally inappropriate. Uh, in many of these situations, it's totally inappropriate, or it's always appropriate, and then it doesn't mean anything. So um, the question is, my question is, what is this word about? Why did it come into usage? And what does what does this tell us about um, certain hegemonial histories? So again, how is improvisation can lead us a little closer to this? I have done this popular opposite pairs of of terms, and you can try to position where improvisation lies in between these between holy and earthy. It probably most people would go for earthy between work and play. Many people would go for play. Um, between orderly and spontaneous, most people would go for spontaneous. Uh, between refined and raw, I think people would tend to go for raw. Between bad and good, that depends on your ideological standpoint. And between durable and ephemeral, it's also more towards the ephemeral, what people think of as improvisation. So there is a kind of word field, conceptual field around this word that has, has certain attachments. And um, this is what I want to unfold, how this word field itself is slightly problematic. Um, I've been for many years now dealing with the word comprovisation because uh, in my practice, I think that Improvisation doesn't really help me a lot in thinking through things, neither does composition. And I've unfolded a little bit. You can see the structure of um, how things are partly improvised, partly composed. Um, it goes from chin music, which is really the ideal is a total com total improvisation. You should not know what you should what you're going to play. Um, and the most um, fixed thing is uh, the fusion of a fixed media file, which again is not without improvisation, but it has the least amount of improvisation in it. So, and, and in between, there are all kinds of practices. I only name a few, of course, that, um, that use improvisation in different degrees. And already we can see that it's becoming to become a slightly hazy term because it's used everywhere, but uh, the question is one of degree and it's not one of category. And if things are matters of degree and not of category, then they become a little bit less useful in discourse because they depend on the sentence it depends on. Um, okay, so this is an improvisation, obviously it looks like one and it's Beethoven. So. We already see the dichotomy here uh, between improvisation and composition very clearly in, a, in, in one of the most um, prominent defenders of, or de not defenders, but most prominent proponents of composed music in the West. And um, the time around which this piece of paper was written on is approximately the time also when the term improvisation came into use. It's not a very old term. Um, here's an excerpt from the etymology dictionary around 
the late 18th century. Um, the term gets into usage. Um, from the sources which are cut off there, the, the, the kind of quoted sources, um, it appears that in English at least, it was used to refer to Italians, Italian poets who tended to improvise on ottava rime, and um, and this was called by the Italians improvisato, and the, the, the English visitors took on this term. Uh, but it's also from the French improvisation. So there's there's a Latin root to all of this, and. Um, I just want you to note the word extempore and extemporaneously because it will become important later. So improvisation is not a definable reality in art making. It is a kind of concept that people use to describe something in art making, but most live art does not really cleanly divide along a line. This is improvised, this is composed. Um, not even in music. <clears throat> Actually, a lot of the improvisation in music was used for a practice that had been common un until that time um, called cantare super librum, which was a polyphonic improvisation without a written score. So you had a cantus firmus, a, a, a line of music, which was your kind of main melody, and people just improvised on it. They didn't write out the polyphony. Um, there's a wonderful video if you want to know more about this on uh, in the early music sources, which is one of the best channels for early music anyway. And uh, there's a link here, but you can e easily find it if you type in early music sources in Cantare Super Libre. So the word was not used before the eight, late 18th century so much, maybe in Italy a few decades earlier, but not much. What were musicians doing before that? Were they all not improvising? Were they all singing folk songs exactly the way they were always sung? And or did they all have their noses and scores um, and did not have any single creative idea on the spot? That seems very unlikely. So if this was a practice that was older, what was what does this word mean? Um, so to the use the word improvisation would really not make sense to many music traditions because, of course, they don't have any tradition of writing music as texts and therefore also no concept of musical exegesis or interpretation, hermeneutics. So this dichotomy does not simply apply to, to the, what they do. In most music traditions, including many art music traditions like Chinese and Korean and Indian, um, music is made from a set of internalized rules and preconceived dramaturgical structures applied to the moment and to the context at hand. It's a little bit like the Italian ottawa rime uh, improvisers who have a fixed format. They would also improvise sonnets, they would improvise other forms and fills that idea with something that comes up spontaneously, which is not the contemporary use of improvisation. Um, so a performance is a kind of unfolding of these rules uh, undertaken by a collective or by a concrete individual with all their background and all their knowledge. And um, even in folk music, a song might have a kind of common outline, but each singer will sing it a little differently. And in many, for example, Arabian music or in Indian music, a rhythm may have a basic form that you can write down, but no one actually ever plays that form as is. It's not what you do when you do that music. It's just an abstract, a kind of idea of what this rhythm would be. So improvisation doesn't matter. Uh, and it only becomes useful at all when you can compose offline. So if the act of composing is not something that you do on the spur of the moment. Um, that was invented in Europe around 1100 um, and it gained traction very slowly actually. Uh, first, music notation was invented a little earlier but it was really kind of a device to remember things, a mnemonic device. Um, it was deliberately incomplete in order to allow for this flexible adaptation. Um, 
And the first musical notations were more like this digest of best practices, you know, very helpful if you want to music, music, but not binding you to anything. Um, and if you have notation that has to be actually performed as is, it's mostly used for teaching contexts um, or for a practice of learned elites like monks or other people who have time to devote to such things. Um, only gradually did this notion take hold that a score is a text in the sense that it has the Im total emotion, the total artistic value that a creator has imbued it with. And that what you do as a musician is to unfold the deeper layers of this text. So musical practices are very resilient in that sense. So the old practices went on and on, as you can see with Cantaris Super Librum, which went on into the 18th century. And so it took more than half, not half a century, but half a millennium, actually, uh, my text is wrong there, half a millennium for the powerful European elites to define and redefine music as an object. And at that point, musicians felt, or people felt that what musicians normally do was improvised. So everything that people normally did was improvised. And the thing that the elites thought was better was real music, composed music. And that was around the end of the 18th century. So um, it's the same time where composers were elevated into secular priests and godlike creators. Beethoven is the first one of those. Mozart still was a, a kind of servant, but Beethoven was then a god. So in, it's exactly the time that the word improvisation comes into general usage. Um, and now we come back to this word extempore, um, which was used before for descri to describe what happens. So extempore means snatched out of the flow of time. You're in time and extempore, something comes out. This is totally neutral as a word. Improviso means without preparation, without provisions. And this has a moral overtone. Not being prepared is not a good thing in, in, in a complex society. In a, for a financially minded person, you know, to be not prepared for consequences and not have provided for eventualities is not such a good proposition. It's morally unsound. Whereas maybe if you want to appear cool and reckless and charming and it looks good to be like to seem very spontaneous. And these two extremes, being ex spontaneous is good in contradiction to being prepared is good, can sort of play out in this word. And we can see that in every kind of musical practice that claims one or the other for itself. Um, so in a sense, this is how the practice, when it was created, the practice of ex 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 extempore playing, acquired an association with recklessness, with superficiality, with a lack of foresight, with disruption or subversion of an existing order, because an order cannot be improvised. Improvisation must be against the order. It can be an indifference to or a rejection of formal training, which is also a kind of very important thing in a bourgeois society to have formal training. Um, it's also the time when music academies are founded. Um, and it associates easily with other things that are undecidable in this new societies, um, like namely chaos, dirt, moral weakness. Um, and these terms were all used to describe improvisation over the centuries. You, I'm sure that you have also encountered such things even today. Um, so each discussion about the relative merits, what is better, improvisation or composition or whatever, has also been a discussion about social hierarchy. Um, in uh, Western music against, uh, you know, non-Western musics, um, the fact that Western music is composed has had a great value. Um, and other musics that just ramble on like, you know, uncomposedly improvised have lesser value. Uh, or be race in the United States where jazz and improvised music 
was confronted to um, orchestra music. Um, or the free scene versus, versus the official cultural institutions in Europe, which is also an ongoing battle between improvised music and um, you know, composed music. So there's always a social overtone, which is not then extempore thinking. Extempore thinking is the kind of, we all live in the flow of time and you know something comes out of that. And it's actually admirable if you can make the flow of time something interesting. Um, improvisation is, has this inbuilt social struggle to it. And I mentioned colonial struggles because that's a large part of the discourse around this that for example, there's a widespread notion that Indian musicians improvise. Why is this notion there? Because they don't have scores. They do have scores, but they don't use it in concert. They don't look at them. And, um, and uh, so the idea was that Indian musicians improvise and therefore they're not as worthy as Western musicians who play scores, who compose, who write scores. Um, not as creative, not as you know, not as discursive, and so on. Um, and if you know the reality of what happens in Indian music, that's totally absurd, um, because Indian musicians have a lot of composition in their practice. I, I think it's seventy percent composition and maybe thirty percent improvisation, if at all. So there's um, there's this misconception that's been used to classify. So it's clearly Eurocentric. Um, and the fact that you have to use it, as I said, refers to the written composition, the offline composition. If you don't have that in your practice, in your culture, you don't need the word improvisation to describe what musicians are doing. Um, and there's an extreme position that if you are a neurological musician, you actually believe that music is really only the part of the process that is written. That is a common conception in musicology. Musicology commonly rejects performance studies or has commonly rejected until very recently, performance studies as um, serious, in, having, having a serious impact on the quality of the work. So performance studies can study how well the work is interpreted and you know how, how people interpret it in different ways they don't actually reflect back on the work itself because the work is eternally written down. And you can do it wrong, or you can do it right, or you could do it brilliantly, or you could do it shabbily. The work doesn't is not affected by the performance at all. That's the real music. The other one is just the ephemeral shadow of the music. That's a common misconception in, in musicological work. You can see that in every musicological congress proceedings still today. Um, so written music is more durable because of these written things, and it ends really in a kind of white supremacist credo that because there is so much planning and so much thing in, 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 in written music, it has the right to rule the world. It is the world, the music of the world. And um, even, you know, our famous uh, favorite white supremacist Donald Trump in a speech in in uh, in Poland in nineteen in two thousand seventeen, said as a distinction of what Western culture is, it said we write symphonies. I doubt that he knows what a symphony really is and so on. But um, uh, apparently, his speechwriters, also white supremacists, chose this example to show the supremacy of the West over other cultures as the writing of music. Um, there's a little twist here. It has shifted a little bit because recording has changed the game. When you record, you can start to discuss improvised music as a text. And the reach of the word improvisation has slightly shifted since then, so for the last 50, 60, 70 years. It now does not only mean music that you're not prepared for, but music that you have not prepared after also. So post-paired music unpostpaired music if it's not um if it's not you know worked on in a workstation and worked on in a recording studio afterwards it's improvised music music without post-production and this has reduced it a lot to mostly live music and live recorded music as improvised music um 
I'll show you one video then. Hunting is typically for a day three. You never know what happened. This is a modern day. I think you can get the idea. The last thing that I want to point out, and then I would ask you to watch a video online that I can't show anymore, is the question of uncomfortableness. So there's a lot of improvisation now in, in, uh, in, in practices that use recordings and, um, um, and, and notations that, that um, is not seen as improvisation because it works in the comfortable zone of hunting in the supermarket. Um, you know what you're supposed to do, you're doing that, um, and, and most traditional music is like that. So again, traditional music gets written out of the improvisation, um, uh, out of the, the white improvisation thing. In sharp distinction, there's a prevalence or a kind of valorization of improvisation that arises in situations of discomfort where one doesn't know what's happening. Free improv is the key word here. And I took that to one extreme in a, in a, in a project that I did um, 10 years ago, um, which I can't show to you now because it's 10 minutes long, the video. But in natively, uh, basically, Native Angel is a project where um, I asked, I, I pro we programmed computers to improvise with musicians. And the musicians had to navigate a landscape that was at the same time familiar to them because it was their music that was regurgitated to them back in a changed form and utterly unfamiliar because they didn't know what the computer would do at all the, because the computer didn't have any stylistic preference or any social conditioning of any kind and, um, and had to come up with um, responses on the fly. Um, which is not at all free improvisation because it works with the computer software and the computer software has certain conditions and, and rules and, and things. And yet at the same time, it's highly uncomfortable as, a, as an improvisation tactic. And the film, the, the little trailer that is 10 minutes long explains the project very well. And so unfortunately I cannot show it to you, but I can say more about it in discussion if you want. So that's my pitch for now. Thank you.